raise the chairman's uh, use the chairman's privilege, and I'll be a little impolitic. So I'm going to ask Chris because I think you put this politely. Let me see if I understood it. Are the DFIs crowding you out? So that's one question. Second question is uh, to the DFIs. So there's been, so this is of course again a historic debate. Why the U.S. government was really uncomfortable with creating an IFC or an IADD is they thought, why is the private sector doing the job? These folks are going to crowd out the private sector. And then the U.S. government, of course, is always very uncomfortable with subsidies of any kind for all kinds of reasons. That would create an unfair advantage to the firms that received the subsidies over firms that didn't. So there's an unfair playing field. And that leads to another debate, which the IFC has had within its organization and which Treasury has had with it and others. Why do you make direct loans? Why don't you just, and this goes to kind of Nicola's point, why don't you just fund the local financial institutions and allow them to do their job? So those are my kind of two impolitic questions to start. I'll happily take up the challenge of the first question about crowding out. Um, now, the good news, certainly in the African context, is because a lot of the rest of the world has moved into middle-income space, there's a lot of focus on Africa. There's a lot of development money washing around. It's, um, depending on your view of ODA, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I find that a lot of that that ODA support, the, con the concessional support, clusters. They cluster in what I would refer to as middle-income Africa, places that are easy, even I can lend or get institutional investors into Kenya, into Rwanda, again, relatively stable parts of East Africa. Um, and certainly in the ESG areas where I, it's easy for me to work like renewable energy. You cannot swing a cat without hitting a DFI in East Africa in the renewable energy space. I can't touch it because um, it's too easy to finance. As in my example of the, of the social infrastructure here, I'm begging the sponsor to let me in because there's too much interest from the DFIs to let me in. Um, so it's selective. Um, and that was the point why I prodded Mark a little bit about risk taking. Um, I would like there to be a formal test, a formal test as to whether we on the private sector are able to finance. And I think also the point about coordination, there's the, there was a reference made to the country platforms, which the World Bank Group has, has advocated. Uh, one of the reasons that it's also, there's so much aid in Africa is because there's a lot of different, different motivations, of course. The European Union is keen to get a lot of money into Africa, so people rightly do not get into boats and cross the Mediterranean. That money and a lot of the bilateral agencies have a lot of different motivations. And so therefore the money comes into Africa, not necessarily well coordinated. And again, it's hard for institutions like myself to find our place. Great, so a few comments to, to add. Um, firstly, I think that you know, the biggest role that, that DFIs can play is helping to overcome this uh, huge information gap that investors can't price the risk in these markets because they don't know what it is. The biggest role that DFIs play is going in and doing those first transactions and discovering what the actual risk is. And I think the best way that we help then transmit that information to private investors, databases aside, we will get that GEMS data, data out there eventually, is through co-investment, actually taking investors along with us and so that they learn from the experience of being exposed to the same assets we're involved in. And so you know, we went from being an organization which pretty much was just investing our own capital to now we, we invest the dollar 20 of other people's capital for every dollar of our own money and so so i think that is the key so when you think about crowding out i i would reframe it it's not really either or i think you actually you know we rarely finance more than 20 percent of any transaction so yes we may be in all of these transactions but we're not in there on our own we're, we 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 bring uh private investors with us uh, and just to to tell you a story about that, which I think illustrates a couple of the, the good points that, that Chris made. When we started our, we have this program called MCPP, which allows you, instead of buying individual syndicated loans, which commercial banks have done for many years, 
to allow institutional investors to buy a whole portfolio. They can do a ticket size of, say, a billion dollars at a time and say, I'll take a piece of every syndicated loan you do, you know, which meet my criteria. The first tranche of that we did, the investors weren't sure about the risk profile, so we actually got a first loss tranche from uh, Swedish CEDA, which gave investors the confidence, the kind of structure that Chris was talking about. We were able to do three more tranches after that without a first loss, because having done the first one with that, and you know that, that first loss guarantee has never been called on that tranche, then investors got comfortable. And now the interesting development in the story, you know, Chris also brought up the point about credit risk insurance, that you know in those earlier tranches, we had some insurance companies coming in uh, and they were investing some of their, you know, some of their um, financial assets into this portfolio. The last tranche we did, we actually had an insurance company come in on their underwriting side. And instead of them investing in these loans, they wrote an insurance contract to take some of the credit risk on these loans. The net effect is the same for us. It allows us to lend more than we would from our own account. So I just tell that story because I think there is an evolution that goes on and these things aren't, aren't static. So it's, it's a constant sort of interplay between what the DFIs do and what the private investors can do. And then the last, last comment, just to pick up on your question, Ethan, about local financial institutions. So first, first comment is, you know, so about 40% of our business is financing local banks. Um, so that is a key part of what we do. But, and this was a comment you know, I would have made on the first panel this morning on, on, on the discussion about you know, term lending by banks is, you know, again, personal view, others may not share. I don't think banks are actually fit for purpose for doing term lending in many cases. Just because some of the developed markets develop that way doesn't mean it's necessarily the best model for, for low-income countries. Banks are great at doing payments and short-term debt and revolving facilities and things, not for doing term finance. So we need to find other models for that. And so what we're doing a lot of work on now, together with the World Bank, is actually the development of local capital markets. Increasingly, in these countries, you have pools of savings, insurance companies, pension funds, looking for you know, long-term investment opportunities. Too much of that money is just sitting in government paper because they have nothing else to invest in. That is a great source of financing for the long-term debt that, that you need to finance. Instead of thinking we need to fix the banks, let's fix the capital markets. And so that's part of our agenda. When I was a young banker, the senior banker told me the first day, there's only one thing you need to know, match your assets and liabilities. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Open it up. Questions? <laughs> Comments about the credit mic? insurance. John, could you take the mic? I, I was involved in founding, founding Asia's very first credit insurance company for all the reasons that we've been discussing this morning, Asia Limited. It moved forward very successfully had a broad ASEAN portfolio, including even some Korean risk. And then came the fateful day in 1997 when the bot devalued 50%. And with ours, so too did the currencies of each and every ASEAN country. Short end of story, the portfolio of Asia Limited was 50% underwater within 48 hours. And even though it was uh, supported dramatically so by the Asian Development Bank and Singapore, the company failed. And so my point is the practical world of credit ratings in the class of countries we're discussing can play a shockingly important role in whether or not such an entity is viable. Any other question? We can pull a couple. Okay. Um, so this is a, a question really for Chris, but as implications for the broader panel, which is you articulated for us in the example you gave of the WERT deal a uh, critical role for insurance companies, like local insurance companies, in providing the assurance that let you repackage the debt in a way that external investors uh, understood it. So. Could you tell us a little bit about like what was the thing that let that company, uh, I believe it was AITA, properly insure the debt 
so that their kind of distribution of assets and liabilities across multiple insurance contracts enabled them to kind of confer their credibility upon the Cote d'Ivoire debt, which would not otherwise have had it. Like, what's the thing that they do as an organization that others are not? And do we need more of those organizations? Do we need to increase their capacity? Like, what's the way that we make that accessible for more uh, more investments than just the few that you are arduously pursuing? Thank you for the thank you for the question. And I get there there are two elements, which which constitute the answer. Number one, um, Africa Trade Insurance is a little organization, but because they have supranational and sovereign shareholding, they represent a small version of a multilateral development bank, and therefore they have the preferred creditor call on the sovereign that is a shareholder that, in the event of difficulty, Africa Trade Insurance will very quickly engage in the manner in which the World Bank or the African Development Bank would early on to try to sort out the, the underlying source of the potential non-payment. Presumably, because they're on the ground, they can get involved more quickly. Because the African Development Bank is the largest shareholder, they will also use the weight of the AFDB in Abidjan to lean on some of the clients with this difficulty. So that's, that's all the magic and the mystery of the preferred credit treatment and how the multilaterals engage, both practically because they're on the ground and can engage directly, and also because of their interlinkage to the other development banks. In Africa, as you know well, if you don't pay any of the multilaterals, it's it's pretty tough going. That's a hard choice to make because all of the others, of course, are engaged and disbursement will stop. More practically, Africa Trade Insurance, because they're small, they reinsure up into the Lloyd's market, and I didn't mention this specifically on the slide because of time, they reinsure between 80 and 90 percent of their exposure. So a lot of the remarkable power of that institution is not because they're a multilateral, although that helps. It's because the Lloyd's, and remember, the Lloyd's market has big AA and A-plus reinsurance companies behind it. That's where the power of ATI comes. These people, before ATI started working really proactively about two years ago, had never been to Africa, except in very select in South Africa, in the big projects. But to do this kind of work, they rely on the fact that ATI has made the case that if there's trouble, if there's any trouble, we will get engaged. And therefore, it's a combination of the sophistication of the political risk insurance in the Lloyd's market that covers banks like ourselves. I'm, we are the largest user of political risk insurance in the London market. We have a big book, a lot of international exposure, and we insure it. So that knowledge is up there. But stepping into this kind of a transaction is unusual. And I'll add one last point, and it's a little bit of a technical point, but you see how far we're jumping here. When they insure banks like ourselves in a big project, they know deep down we're not going to make a claim. It's one of the ugly aspects of insurance, which has to be said. They don't expect to pay. They really, in the multilaterals, in those beautiful guarantees, they also don't really expect to pay. Um, it's one of the realities. In the event of trouble, banks like ourselves are very nice. We restructure. We allow for the repayment profile to be reprofiled in a more accommodating fashion, so our money's good over time, even if we have to suffer a slight delay in payment. But we don't ask for the money. In this structure, as you remember, it's investors, it's insurance companies and pension funds that are actually benefiting from the insurance, not the nice banks that you can call together in London. So one of the tricky parts of the trade was explaining to the reinsurers that it'll be cool. The pension funds are not going to ask to be paid if there's trouble. And the insurance companies, as investors, would also not ask to be paid. They understand the game, that we're in it for the long term. Development sometimes there's a little bit of friction. We'll see. It's one of the really interesting aspects of the trade. It's taking the insurance, the insurance product into the market. And that's part of the learning all around about how to really operationalize in size these kinds of trades. I, I wonder whether you could walk us through that Columbia land tenure arrangement or impact uh, investment that you have, because I understand this is an obviously critical area in many parts of the world, especially conflict affected countries. But it's been very hard to get private sector provision of some kind of 
uh, loan package for getting your property registered and getting that title deed. So what did you do? And then is there pri any evidence of private sector emulation of what you've done? Or how would you scale it to, to, to private sector? Yeah, so the venture that we invested into in Colombia is called Suyo. Um, it is a private company. The in a, Its target customer to date has really been displaced populations who are squatting on land in peri-urban areas in Colombia. So quite a few displaced people from the Civil War. Um, if you, as a displaced person squatting on land, want to get legal title in Colombia, you have to engage a variety of advisors, consultants. You have to come in and get somebody to survey. You have to employ a lawyer, a government fixer to go through the process. Each of these charges a transaction fee, and sometimes there are fraudulent providers out there, so there's a lot of uncertainty. So it's, there's a lot of friction as an individual trying to get title to your land. Suyo came in and said, look, we're going to house all of those services in one place. So if you want to get title, come to us. We employ the lawyers. We employ the surveyors. We know how the government process works. We employ ex-government officials. We can do this for you for about a third of the cost. And we can guarantee you title. You don't pay if you don't get title at the end of the day. The challenge for this company, a couple things. One is they would love to do this as well for small farmers. That's a lot harder to do, so they've been negotiating with aggregators, cooperatives, others, who represent a group of farmers where the aggregator may say, this is a benefit that we'll provide to all the farmers that feed into us. The other challenge has been one of affordability. So even though it comes down by about a you know two-thirds of the cost is cut off, it can still be too expensive for a poor urban squatter to pay for this. Um, so we had co-invested with another impact investor, Omidyar Network, in this, and they have a, a real focus on property rights. And so we came together with Omidyar to look at solutions to that. Um, what we're trying out now is we went out and found a local microfinance institution and said, look, you're not lending, you don't have a loan product right now for land titling. Why don't you create one? And we'll provide you with the low-cost capital to on-lend to potential customers of Suyo. Um, let's work with you. We'll provide a very small facility, half a million dollars right now, guarantee around that facility too, so the local microfinance provider doesn't really take on risk. But let's use you as the intermediary. Start lending to some of these potential customers and see what your default rate is like. See, see if customers are really willing to repay. That facility, it's interesting, has a lot of promise, but it's been very slow to get going because the MFI is still utilizing all of its risk assessment approaches that it does traditionally, but for a brand new market. So when they look at potential customers, almost all of them have been screened out to date for lending. So we're working with them to ease those, um, ease the way in which they process and assess potential borrowers, to say, take on a little bit more risk because we're, we're covering the risk for you. Make these loans and let's better understand whether there's a market there. Because if you can address the affordability constraint with so many of these ventures that we see who are trying to sell products or services to low-income consumers, it is an affordability issue. Um, and if we can get, overcome that, then this may take off more. Um, the broader question around are others doing this? We've only seen a few private sector companies in the, war, in the developing world and emerging markets that are providing some form of service for land titling. Um, it'd be nice to see more, but there aren't too many yet. Of course, land titling is a requirement of a lot of MCC countries. Right. Uh, last question. Great. So, um, uh, well, two more. We'll take two, that they're both going to be quick, right? So we're running a little quick, late. yes. Yeah, great. And okay. Then, and then one more. Oh, so mine's twofold, but it's across this issue of coordination. So first, I know, Neil, that you mentioned that there's this effort within the IFC to coordinate amongst yourselves, uh, but then there's the issue of potentially crowding out the private sector, but you said you bring investors with you. So is there an effort to coordinate with interested private sector investors? And if so, what is it? Or do you just choose who comes along with you for these deals? And then to Chris, because you're investing in places that a lot of private sector investors aren't yet ready because the deals are so small, once they scale up, is there a pathway to make them of interest to the IFC or to bigger private investors once they get big enough? Hello. Um, so my question is also, I think, mostly directed towards um, Chris Walker. And it's about um, 
kind of what, how do you basically define impact investing? Um, you know, there's often seems to be kind of a sliding scale or kind of a gray area. Um, for instance, one growing well-known private equity impact investor is Bain Capital Double Impact Fund, which is run by some of the top finance kind of professionals in the industry. But when you take a look at their portfolio, they have companies like By Chloe, which is like a vegan restaurant chain, and also a Planet Fitness franchise. Um, and of course, these investments are probably good and might benefit some people. Um, but kind of what is that borderline between getting dangerously close to defining any investment as impact investing because people might benefit from it um, and kind of making you know, themselves feel better about that. So basically my question is, what is the line for defining impact? Should there be a line and who should decide it? Great, Great. okay, uh, short of time so I'll answer quickly. Um, on the coordinating with private investors, one thing we do with these country diagnostics that we do in about 20 countries a, a year is once we, we have the results, we actually convene the three-way conversation between government agencies, private investors, and, and DFIs to actually talk about the opportunities. So we, we try and bring people in at that level. In terms of um, providing opportunities to a broader range of investors, we try and take more programmatic approaches where we can. A good example is the scaling solar program in Africa, where instead of financing solar power projects one at a time with help countries put together programs of solar power investments, with, you know, like 10 or 12 at a time, which they can then uh, tender out and you can get a broad range of private investors uh, participating. And I do want to jump in on the, the impact investing question before Chris, because something that we've been doing over the last year is developing a market standard for what it means to be an impact investment fund or institution. We have a set of nine principles. It's a bit like earlier we did the equator principles. They're called the operating principles for impact management. We have, I think, 85 institutions as of today, both public and private sector, who are signed up to follow those principles. And the key thing that makes it work is that they're required to disclose their impact management system. So you can, Bain Capital hasn't signed up yet, but others have. But if anybody has signed up, you'll be able to look at their disclosure statement and you can judge for yourself whether you think they have a credible approach to selecting assets for impact. But Chris? Great. No, thank you. I was going to point your way because the IOC really has, the, I think, the best and most prominent um, program right now to look at that. Um, a broader answer to the second question around... Um, more or less impact washing, green washing, how do you know? You know? At the end of the day, it's the person who has the capital who's doing the investing. Is has Everybody has a different um, set of things that they're looking for. Some people are focused on sector. I care mostly about solving climate change, so I'm going to focus on renewable energies. Other people care more about social issues. Some people care more about higher financial return as long as they're not investing in really bad stuff. Other people can accept a lower return as long as they're having major impact. So there are all different shades of impact that people are looking for. And I think the real answer to this is better transparency and disclosure of data on impact. Um, we already have a, you know, accounting standards that, that, yes, there are a lot of assumptions built into that, but we have some basis for comparability across investments. We need the same from the impact side, such that people who have the money to invest better understand what they're getting and where the trade-offs are. And then it's up to them to choose where they want to put their money based on that. But we're not there yet from an impact assessment standpoint. But I think that's going to be the answer in the long run. We need standards. We need a, a, a way to an, um, assess impact in a comparable way across various deals so that people can make their own decisions. Um, in terms of the first question around the scalability of these really early stage investments, I can just share anecdotally from our portfolio. I think uh, we've done about 20 deals now. 75% of them have all raised subsequent rounds of capital. So we are seeing follow on into some of these deals. We're venture capital investors. Investors. We expect half or more of the deals to fail at some point in time. But we are starting to see some of these companies access uh, subsequent rounds of financing. Um, we have had a couple of successful exits as well, one of them in part thanks to the IFC that came in in a subsequent stage in a company, and we are able to sell our shares to another investor in that round. So we are seeing some of that. I mean, that, that's the ideal that you know, because we're subsidized, we should only be in there at the very early stages. We should be de-risking. We should be doing everything we can to help these companies grow as businesses because as they scale as businesses, they scale their impact. But then let the other investors who have more capital come in and do the subsequent rounds of deals. And so, yeah, it's still being proven out. Great. Any final comments, uh, Chris Guy or 
Yeah, I, I think just to, to complement, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to coordination, in particular when we are using subsidized funding, we think that is essential because we are otherwise going to crowd out. And I think just, uh, I think, uh, you know, Christopher was mentioning the whole idea of crowding out is a very nuanced concept because, you know, in infrastructure, probably, you know, it's a ripe sector for us to, as DFIs, to be very careful, much less if we are using concessional finance. When you are looking at, you know, some of the small whole farmer agri in Africa, there is still just no one going there. So, you know, about 40% of the deals that we have as IFC need some concessional finance support. When you look at all of our activities, it's not even 10% of the activities that have concessional finance support. So I think we also need to nuance that aspect of it when it comes to the crowding out. Thanks. Thank you. This was kind of an optimistic panel. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Great Always. note to end on. So thank you so much. Sure. And uh, we'll go with uh, bigger to lunch, and then we'll have Rachel after. Fantastic. Thank you.